this one. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here, and uh, those of the, you that know me usually find that I don't have a beard. Um, it's because I've come to this event that I've actually grown it in honour. Uh, normally, I don't like to come to public events because of the work that we do, but uh, it'll be off when I get back to London. I uh, want to tell you now about something very important. Uh, that there is a way of disrupting human trafficking, uh, and I think it's been fantastic, the sessions we've had today. Uh, my job is to actually bring visibility to human trafficking. Ladies and gentlemen, can I just ask, how many of you in the room hate to lose? Me too. We're in the right place. We're together. But I hate to lose in human trafficking. I do not want to pass this legacy down to my children. I think this is the time when we, can, we have enough sources of information to make a real difference. And talking about unique skill sets, uh, as was mentioned, everyone in this room has that. So I wanted to be a surgeon when I was growing up. Um, I didn't make it, uh, but I now become surgical in what I do. And I'll explain that, how my team operates. I want to go back to this number. It's 150 billion. This is what we focus on. It's the third largest crime in the world. In fact, I argue that this number is far too low, and it probably is the second largest crime. But people tend to forget about that this is a crime. At the same time, I defy the definition that this is all organized crime. I actually believe that this is business. Uh, and I think Neil made that point earlier on. This is just a quick and dirty uh, assessment. So who is making money out of this? Well, for sex trafficking, individuals and probably organized crime. But for forced labor, 68%, it's definitely businesses. And organ trafficking, something that's not talked about very often. But I would suggest that the medical profession have a role to play in that as well. So I don't think this is transnational organized crime. I think, especially for forced labor, this is business operating transnationally committing crimes. And it's happening in plain sight. Quick video. Human trafficking is the world's third largest crime, providing high financial reward with low risk of prosecution. Liberty Asia is working to bring the financial sector into the fight against the proceeds of human trafficking. Banks need information on who these traffickers are. Liberty Asia has pioneered a unique program partnering with NGOs across Asia to monitor local media to provide trafficking profiles to financial institutions. On a daily basis, trained NGO partners forward stories on arrests of human traffickers to Liberty Asia. Liberty Asia collates and passes these stories securely to the world's largest third-party intelligence database providers. Over 90% of submissions have resulted in new and updated profiles on human traffickers in these databases. This information is used powerfully in daily decisioning on new and existing customers by over 5,200 banks and other financial institutions. Liberty Asia, NGOs, and Thomson Reuters World Check, partnering to bring powerful information on human traffickers right to the heart of bank decision making, disrupting the proceeds from slavery. So, together with Thomson Reuters World Check, we've pioneered a program where we work with 25 NGOs across the region, uh, and they daily feed us stories of people being arrested for human uh, trafficking and forced labor and child labor. Um, this is a unique proposition. It's never been done before. I'm very thankful to Thomson Reuters for having to have the trust to, to walk with us on this journey. But ladies and gentlemen, what we're doing now is placing names of arrested human traffickers into the hands of bankers. We're not talking, I mean, whilst red flags, typologies, trainings and so on absolutely have their role, we are surgical. Names. 
If you're banking that person, then you need to take action about it. So we have a chance here. I, I will skip because I've got 15 slides in only 10 minutes, so I won't uh, spend too much time. But if you want to, to know more about what we're doing and how we do it, please come and grab me afterwards and give me your card. Our second method, uh, video I want to show you is about names of entities. US dollars are generated from slavery. Companies facilitating or benefiting from slavery operate in plain sight, yet very few of these companies are ever identified, especially in Asia. These companies use local, regional, global banks and banking services. We show why it is relevant to banks and provide information on what to look for. We outline clearly how Asian-based or Asian-originated slavery operates highlighting geographic and industry risk, identifying those entities involved in victim recruitment, identifying entities using forced labor in agriculture, construction, manufacturing, entertainment, mining, forestry, and fishing, identifying the products or goods made from slave labor entering the global supply chains, highlighting the money flows and institutions facilitated bringing the might of the financial sector into the fight with a single mission to disrupt the business of slavery. Again, we're able to collate information. Information from NGOs on the ground, from other business partners, from other public sources, uh, and put that together with the sole purpose of visualizing how slavery operates. Here in Asia, forced labor. We're able to identify right down to the companies that are involved in it, that own the assets, that are involved in the supply chain, all the way through to supermarkets or others who are buying produce from slavery. It takes a lot of careful research to get it right, uh, but I'm, very del I'm delighted to announce that it is working and working well. So now we work with banks, we also work with uh, supermarkets, big purchases and so on, uh, and various industry groups as well. This is a, a typology that we've put together. It was actually the case that uh, my colleague Archana was talking about earlier on in Benjina. So we identified here 130 boats that were being used by the organization, uh, including 17 uh, large refrigerated carrier ships. We estimate between 2,500 to 5,000 victims were involved in this, uh, but the proceeds of this went all the way around the world, about a half a billion US dollars over the 10 years it was operating. The fish from this, ended up in the supermarkets in the US, the UK, and Australia. Uh, and we have a, a, another story, I don't think I have time to explain, how we've actually tried to engage with some of those supermarkets and advise them confidentially of the risks that they're facing. And after a bit of a, a stuttering start, actually they've responded very favorably. So we're here to give information out to business decision makers, be it in banks, be it in supermarket chains, be it in uh, uh, other manufacturing uh, groups to help them make better business decisions. This is the same thing visualized in WorldCheck, who are partners on this. Uh, so that information, if you're using WorldCheck, uh, is, is in there as well. We also had the pleasure and privilege of advising Interpol, uh, who issued a, what is called a purple notice, a notice out to all their member countries on slavery in the fishing industry in Southeast Asia. So this is another way of getting information out there to advise those who are making decisions, both business and in prosecutions, of what is really happening. So just to wrap up, we develop typologies. We do not publish them. We make them available under confidentiality to banks uh, and large businesses. Uh, we've developed uh, eight so far. We've identified just under 8,000 victims. But the shocking thing is, is the proceeds, 1.5 billion US dollars we've estimated from these eight operations in Asia. We're not alone in this. We've got some great partners helping us develop this, but we're also training other NGOs to do similar. 
and I'm delighted that uh, a number of them have already uh, put their hand up and, and partnering with us to develop typologies on things that they know about, uh, and that's very exciting for us. As you can see, we, uh, we give out, uh, make our information available to the top 10 global banks, uh, various due diligence firms, regulatory bodies, and so on. Uh, and I'm, if you're from a bank, uh, I'm very excited to, uh, to mention that we've also been working with the uh, Financial Action Task Force, Egmont, and the APG Group to actually uh, work with them to increase awareness of human trafficking as an anti-money laundering offence, uh, and all three have started working groups. So I would expect in the next uh, uh, 9 to 12 months that all three will produce uh, new guidance on human trafficking and anti-money laundering threats, which is good. It's great. It's something that will drive uh, everyone forward and give them better clarity on what we should be doing. This is my last slide, just in the interest of time, because I'm slightly over. Um, what we do find when we're doing research, and it really goes to the point that Ambassador Cedarbacker was making before, is this is business, and this is in plain sight. We don't find shady groups. We find legitimate businesses. We find uh, recruitment agencies, but we find normal transportation methods. Uh, we find normal uh, global supply chain. It's very hard uh, for banks to spot this. And that's why we do the work we do, to give visibility on who are the actors, the players behind this. So, I'm a bit of a, a fan of uh, Sun Tzu, knowing your enemy. And that's the kind of thing we try to do, is to highlight who is behind this business of slavery. Because it is a business, and we need to take it as a fight. Uh, and if you don't like to win... I hope you're motivated to, uh, to come and work with us as well. So thank you very much. I'll end there as I'm out of time. But if you would like to chat with me about our work and how you can potentially receive that, please come and find me at the end of this. Thank you.